All right, so today we're really getting into it, uh, going deep on how Kenya tackles corruption. Yeah. And I mean, like really getting into it. We're not just looking at news articles and you know, kind of getting the surface level. Right. We're going straight to the source, the actual law, the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act. And that's what makes this so interesting. You know, anyone can read a news article, but having this primary source material, it gives us a whole new level of understanding. Exactly. We're talking about the revised 2016 edition straight from the Kenya Law website. So this is like getting a behind the scenes look at their strategy. Exactly. And it's not just some, you know, dusty old document. This is a living, breathing thing that reflects how Kenya is choosing to address a very real issue. Absolutely. So uh, let's get right to it. The act's official title is a bit of a mouthful. The Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act. It was initially passed in 2003 and then got a major revision in 2016. And that revision, that's important. It tells you that this wasn't just a quick fix. They went back and said, OK, what's working, what isn't? And they put in the effort to make it better. And they really went into detail, too. They didn't just say corruption is bad and call it a day. They defined everything super specifically. Right. They define corruption and economic crime in a really comprehensive way. And that's key because it shows you the scope of what they're trying to address. This isn't just about like small time bribery. We're talking abuse of office election interference, messing with public funds. It's a big deal. It really shows you how seriously they're taking this issue. It's like they said, we're drawing a line in the sand and anything that falls under these definitions, we're coming after it. Exactly, and to be effective, you need that clarity. You need those clear boundaries. And by being so specific in their definitions, it gives them the power to actually go after a wider range of offenses. Okay, so we've got our definitions down. But how does this actually play out in the real world? How is the act structured? So the act is meticulously organized. It's broken down into different parts, each tackling a different aspect of their anti-corruption strategy. You've got sections on investigation offenses, evidence, international jurisdiction. It's incredibly thorough. It really gives you a sense of their commitment. It's like they thought of everything. Right. And that level of detail, it's crucial because it lays the groundwork for enforcement. But, we'll get into the specifics later, but just knowing that this level of thought went into the structure, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's like we're getting a glimpse into how they're trying to build a system that can actually create lasting change. Exactly. And that's what makes this so compelling. We're not just looking at a list of rules. We're looking at a nation's attempt to grapple with a complex problem. Okay, so they're serious, they're organized, they've got a plan, but what's actually in this plan? What kind of tools are we talking about? Let's uh, let's dive into some of the key sections and find out. Let's do it. Okay. One of the things that jumped out at me when we were looking through the act was the part about uh, special magistrates. Mm. It sounds kind of dramatic. Right? A little bit, yeah. Like, are we talking, you know, special robes gavel made of solid gold? What's the deal with these special magistrates? Well, they're not quite like that, but it is significant. You see, having these dedicated magistrates specifically for corruption cases... It's a strategic move. Okay, so you're saying it's not just a regular magistrate who happens to be hearing a, a corruption case. They're specifically trained for this. Exactly. They're chosen for their deep understanding of this specific area of law. So it's kind of like uh, you wouldn't want a heart surgeon operating on your brain, right? You'd want someone who specializes in that. That's a great way to put it. It's about having that specialized knowledge and experience to effectively handle these complex cases. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. So by creating this specific role, it's like Kenya's making a statement about gotcha. how seriously they're taking this. Absolutely. It shows a real commitment to tackling corruption head on. They're investing in a system that's equipped to handle these cases with the expertise they deserve. It's like they're saying this is important enough to us that we're going to build a system specifically designed to address it. Exactly. And it's not just about having the right people in place either. The act itself has some really innovative tools built into it. Like what? Well, remember that section we talked about earlier, the one about unexplained assets, section 57? Oh, yeah, yeah. That one definitely caught my eye. It's like they're saying if you're living a lifestyle you can't explain, do it, you better have a good explanation. Exactly. It really shifts the burden of proof, which is huge. Because proving corruption is notoriously difficult. Yeah. Right. It's not like people are usually keeping detailed receipts of their bribes. Right. So this clause, it gives them a way to take action, even in cases where direct evidence might be hard to come by. So how does it actually work? Basically, if someone is living a lifestyle that their legal income can't support, the court can consider that as evidence of corruption. So no more. Oh, this. 
I, uh, I found this bag of money. It's a lot harder to get away with that now. It forces potentially corrupt individuals to be accountable for their wealth. It's like they're closing those loopholes that people used to exploit. Exactly. And another important aspect of this act is how it protects the people who often play a key role in uncovering corruption. The whistleblowers. Right. Section 65, if I remember correctly. Right. It's all about making sure those individuals are protected. You got it. And it's crucial because speaking out against corruption can be incredibly risky. People can lose their jobs, their reputations, even face threats to their safety. So it's about creating an environment where people feel safe coming forward. Exactly. Section 65 prohibits any kind of retaliation against someone for providing information about corruption. It's about encouraging people to speak up without fear of retribution. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because without that protection, who would be willing to put themselves at risk? Exactly. It's essential for building trust and fostering a culture of accountability. It's like they're saying, we need your help to fight this and we're going to have your back. And there's one more section I want to touch on because it really surprised me, Section 67. Okay, what's so special about Section 67? This section basically says that Kenyan citizens are accountable for corruption, even if they're doing it outside of Kenya. Wait, really? Yeah, we're talking international jurisdiction here. So even if you're, you know, on vacation in Bali, sipping a Mai Tai, yeah. you can still be held accountable under Kenyan law. That's the gist of it. If a Kenyan citizen engages in corrupt conduct abroad, that would be an offense in Kenya. They can be brought to justice under this act. Wow, that's a bold move. Yeah. It's like they're saying, we're not going to let our citizens get away with corruption just because they're across a border. Exactly. And it sends a strong message, both domestically and internationally. It shows that they're serious about upholding integrity everywhere, not just within their own borders. It's really amazing to see how much thought and detail went into crafting this act. But I got to ask the big question, does it actually work? That's the million dollar question, right? And unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Nothing in life is ever that simple, is it? Exactly. You see, having a strong legal framework like this act, that's a crucial first step. But it's only one piece of the puzzle. Okay, so what are the other pieces? Well, you need the right people in place to implement and enforce it. You need resources. Uh, and crucially, you need the political will to make it happen. So it's not enough to just have good laws on the books. Yeah. You need the whole system to be on board and working together. That's exactly it. And that can be a challenge anywhere, not just in Kenya. But you know what's encouraging to me? It's that the act itself shows a willingness to adapt and evolve. Remember how we talked about the Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission being replaced? Yeah. That tells me that they're actively looking at what works and what doesn't. They're not afraid to make changes if something isn't working. It's like they're saying, we're in this for the long haul. We're committed to finding solutions, even if it means going back to the drawing board. Exactly. And that's a really important takeaway for me. Fighting corruption isn't about winning a single battle. It's about changing the game entirely. It's about creating a culture of integrity that can withstand the test of time. And that's something that takes time and persistence and a willingness to keep learning and adapting. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, we dove deep into the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act of Kenya. And wow, what a journey it's been. We went from this dense legal document to uncovering a nation's strategy, its commitment, and even, I'd say, its hopes for a brighter future. It's been a pleasure joining you today. The pleasure's all mine. And to you, our listener, thank YU for taking this deep dive with us. If you're eager to keep exploring, remember the Kenya Law website is just a click away. It's a treasure trove of information just waiting to be discovered. Until next time, keep asking those questions and keep diving deeper.